Psalm 119, verse 9. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes and I will not forget your word. Let's worship together. from Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 through 11. Have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of The second picture now. We had communion last week and now in the second installment of the Why Do We. Um, I'm going to be talking about why do we have Sunday school. And maybe it's a question you've never even asked before, but I'm still going to be the one uh, trying to answer it. So uh, there's, there's a history that goes with Sunday school further back than, than Word of Life and why we specifically do Sunday school. Um, but Let's kind of start there. Sunday school, as, as uh, we have kind of formed it into today, began right before the 1800s, like the 1780s in, in England. Um, there's a bunch of kids always at working, always, always working um, all the time, and they, they didn't have an education. So then some people took it upon themselves, thinking, hey, we should teach these kids something. So what day did they have open? Sundays. So they had Sunday school. Well, we can teach them some math, some reading and writing. Yeah, we can do some reading and writing. What, do you guys, what kind of books do you guys got? Only the Bible? Okay, cool. Let's teach uh, from the Bible. And so that's where they taught from, the Bible. This was, kids were working a bunch. They had to put, you know, some, some child labor laws into place, which limited children to only working 12 hours a day. So it's like school now, um, if you're in high school. Uh, but yeah, they, there was just people that, that valued kids enough, and there was even arguments about it. It's like, hey, should we actually teach these people? Because they're good workers, and we don't really want them to try and like elevate their status. And, but the, the church was kind of like, no, we want to teach these people. We want to share with them God's word. And so it grew and grew and grew. And so it, starting in 1780, by about 1800s, there was about um, 200,000 kids that were enrolled in Sunday school, and they would um, be able to, to read and write, and sometimes they would take their books home and teach their parents some of what they were learning. Uh, and so Sunday school benefited whole families because the kids were learning something, and the parents would benefit from that, and then they'd be lear they learned how to read and write, and so they had opportunities to get better jobs and and so there was this elevation of whole families that came from Sunday school, which is something that we still uh, aim for today. So that's where, that's where Sunday school begins, um, with a lot of catechism training. Um, we have, 
in our, our Confirmation or Faith Foundation's little red book. That's the explanation of Luther's small catechism. Um, there's a whole bunch of questions listed in it, followed by an answer given. Um, and some of you guys are like, yes, I remember having to stand up in front of a church and answer tons and tons of those questions. Um, but they're, they're really, it's a, it's a really pretty good way to learn. The very first question in the, the little red catechism that we have are, what are God's thoughts of you? And the answer written there is, God's thoughts of me are of love and blessing. And the idea is that the teacher would ask this question to give the answer, and then catechesis ends up meaning, uh, is a way of teaching to echo back. And so they would give a question, give them the answer. Give the question, give them the answer. Give them the question, then you say the answer. And so then it starts to become memory. And so there's part of me that in confirmation, and I think we get a, why do we have confirmation, uh, a different time, but that didn't make a whole lot of sense to me on why there was all this memorization. Uh, but then being older and actually s studying some confirmation and, and why it became a thing uh, made it sound really nice where if ever at a point in my life, I'm like, man, God's got to be so disappointed in me. God's got to be thinking just all these sorts of things. I can think to the very first question in the catechism, what are God's thoughts of me? God's thoughts of me are of love and blessing. And so there's lots of answers to be found, and that's, that's how they, they taught people. And so then you'd have, if, I mean, this was like the Church of England and was a little bit state-run, but if it was all like our church running everything in these Sunday schools, you'd have kids that would come through Sunday school, and you, you'd ask the question, what are God's thoughts of me? And everyone would know the answer, God's thoughts of me are of love and blessing. Um, and so that was just a really cool way that, that kids got to learn and, re and repeat back and then learn how to read along with and things like that. Um, but, so that's, that's the beginning. And then there's other churches that have just had Sunday school for a long time. And I don't just want to pretend like Word of Life is the originator of Sunday school because that's not even close to truth. The church is, has always been a place of teaching and learning and uh, ever since Jesus established a church, and it really goes back further into Judaism before that. And people has, have followed Jesus' example and taught others. A few different times, Jesus was asked in the, in the Gospels, what is the greatest commandment? And this is where we're going to have our scripture. We're going way back before the New Testament, into the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 6, verses 1 through 9, for where Jesus got his answer for what is the greatest commandment. Um, a little answer of why he lived the way that he did. And, uh, and I guess a pretty solid foundation for the church and uh, for why for a couple thousand years we've been doing a lot of teaching. So uh, while you're turning to Deuteronomy 6, if you want to in your Bibles or on your phones, it's easy. Deuteronomy is the fifth book in the Bible, so you don't have to scroll way down to the New Testament on your phone. It's just like in that first screen where you're selecting books. Um, but this is the context of it. Deuteronomy is, is the second giving of the law. They had the Ten Commandments. Moses and the Israelites had been wandering around the desert for 40 years. And uh, just about everybody from the old generation has died off. First generation with Moses, a bunch of whiners, complaining all the time. God ended up, hey, all of you, you're not going to see the promised land. Your kids and your kids' kids, they get to see it. You don't get to see it. Even Moses was like, Moses is, like, is looking at it. He's like, hey, God, could I just be in there for a little bit? He's like, nope, and I don't want to hear anything else from you. It's uh, kind of funny, like, God treating Moses like his child, like, I told you no, and that's the last we'll talk of this. Um, and you can it's find it, it's very similar to that. Uh, but thir 40 years in the desert, after God had saved them from slavery in Egypt, they're about to cross over to e uh, into the promised land. Just like the first time the law is given to Moses, we see, uh, God's grace at work as, as Moses is repeating the law, repeating the Ten Commandments. That's how the Ten Commandments start and we see in Exodus and again in Deuteronomy with, a, with I am the Lord your God who saved you, who brought you out of Egypt, who saved you from the house of slavery. That's how it starts. And then, and then the Ten Commandments are listed. I did this for you, therefore have, you shall have no other gods before me. And so Moses uh, reminds them of this and God's grace in, in saving them first and then giving them commandments. 
and uh, in, in Deuteronomy 5, 6, and lists the commandments again. And then Moses practices um, what he is currently preaching slash teaching in chapter 6. So, reading in Jesus' name, Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 9. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules, that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it. That you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you, in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit down in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Here ends the reading of God's word. Martin Luther writes in his, his Deuteronomy volume um, about that, that section, the verse 4 through 9. Uh, he says, See the order of treating the word of God. First, it is to be pondered in the heart. Secondly, impressed faithfully and constantly on the sons by word of mouth. Thirdly, discussed openly and everywhere. Fourthly, written on the hand and drawn before the eyes. And fifth and last, inscribed that on posts and doorways, not in books, since Moses himself had already written them in a book. And I, li I, I like seeing that. Jesus repeats his commandment, this love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and might, with, with his words and his life. Jesus is the only one who fully loves God with all his heart, soul, and might. And he shares this commandment that Moses was told to share with God's people and told them to share it with their kids. And Jesus, though he didn't have any kids of his own, as God looked as, at the nation of Israel as his family. And so he shares the command with tons of people. He teaches in the temples to the religious leaders and, and those gathered there. He teaches others in houses or, or out in the country. He goes and visits some in special meetings. Jesus taught the young and the old, crowds and individuals, the educated and uneducated. He taught traitors to Israel and those overly zealous trying to have Israel overthrow their captors. There was no exclusion from Jesus. He taught when he was sitting, when he was walking, while he was lying down, and when he would get up. In Deuteronomy, before the end of his life, Moses made sure to repeat God's commandments to the next generations those who would inherit the promised land. Jesus repeated God's commandments to those around him, especially to his apostles. For over three years, he walked with them around Israel, teaching them and showing them how to follow God and his commandments with all their heart, soul, and might. He did that over and over and over again before leaving them post-crucifixion, post-resurrection, with this from Matthew 28. Jesus tells his apostles, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you to the end of the age. Go into all nations and make disciples. There's no exclusion there. You want to know who's included in, in all nations? Everyone. Men, women, those pushing 100 years old and those still yet to be a year old. All nations include the strong, the weak, the neighbor, the stranger, the seemingly deserving, and those who we judge to be undeserving. All nations include those who have it put together, those whose lives are falling apart, the sick, the healthy, the rich, and the poor. Jesus makes it very clear. Go, baptize, and teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. Go, be free in giving grace and tell them what I have taught you. It sounds a little bit like the I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. That's taking them out, sending them. Go, out of the house of slavery. 
there's, there's grace given there. And then God gives the commandments, and just like Jesus had taught his disciples, and then tells them there to teach them diligently to their children. People in Moses' day shared God's commands with their family. Jesus shared God's commands with his people and beyond. And then the beginning of the church is instructed to do the exact same. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So, I like sports. Most sports, really, playing them, watching them, um, except for watching baseball. You can argue with me, but I think it's boring. But I like basketball and football, um, and I like the Minnesota Timberwolves and the Minnesota Vikings. And it was a fun enough day yesterday where I decided to grab a second TV and like watch the Timberwolves on mute and watch the Vikings with volume, and I turned them both off before the end of the game. <laughs> you guys were watching the Vikings game. The Wolves also got beat by like 40 points. It's not a good day uh, for, that, for that. But those, those are things also that, that I press on my kids and semi-diligently. Eddie knows that number 22 of the Timberwolves is Andrew Wiggins, because I like, I like Wiggins. And so Eddie will run with the basketball, he'll spin in a circle, and miss layups just like him. <laughs> he also recognizes the Vikings, um, and Mandy reminded him after the touchdown, Eddie, what do you do when the Vikings score a touchdown? And he starts skull clapping, so we got to do that one time yesterday. But really, uh, my, my highlight for those games uh, came before it. I was making pizza. I also really like pizza, sports, pizza. And I've been learning, uh, trying to learn how to make like good pizza at home, dough, my own sauce, all, all that good stuff. So yesterday, I'm stretching the dough out to make a pizza, and Ed is standing next to me on a chair, flour in his hands and his shirt, stretching out dough too. And next to Ed is Vince, flipping over his piece of dough, and moving flour from the counter to the floor. Both got to help me put some sauce on their misshapen dough, throw some cheese on there, and while Ed picked out his toppings for his pizza, Vince was eating the toppings off of his. And he screamed at me when I took his pizza from him and put it in the oven, um, because, you know, everyone likes their toppings unbaked. But I, I like the Timberwolves. I like pizza, so I pass those things on to my kids. I don't, I don't write that on my doorpost or on my hand, but I do still wear shirts to show people and influence my kids. I have Timberwolves clothing. I'm wearing pizza socks. Yeah, pizza socks. They're like my favorite socks. And I've been in conversations with some of you, many of you, that have revolved around one of those two things. I've talked to you guys about Vikings or Timberwolves or pizza. Some of you, I've talked about probably about the Timberwolves while eating pizza. I also love God. And that was something that was pressed on me from, from my parents. The pizza and Vikings came more from my dad, but I was hearing about God's commandments from before I even remember hearing them. But it wasn't just my parents Either. I used to attend Wednesday night kids club where we'd sing songs, memorize a few verses, and hear of God's commandments and his works. My parents had me attend Sunday school as well, so I would hear those same things over and over. And I want to do the same thing for, for my kids because I'm imperfect. It becomes my job to diligently teach my sons what God has commanded. But sometimes I think that there's this part of my actions that, that dictate to Eddie that, that I would like football more than, than playing with him right then. There's things that I do that, that make it look like God isn't first. So I need Eddie to know that I too need grace all the time as a dad. And I want to have backup. So churches, churches te teach people in Sunday school because some, like children who can't read, can't teach themselves and are not always being taught by their parents. They teach it because Jesus commanded it, echoing the whole of the Bible and passing on God's mighty works and commandments and because it is good for us to know God's law and his gospel. So 
why churches have Sunday school. So why do we then, Word of Life, have Sunday school and Kingdom Kids and 45s and youth group? We want to be like Jesus too. And simply we, we value people and we value young people. It's part of the, the fun if you're, if you're thinking to yourself, there's lots of noises from different kids. I tune it out all the time. But there's lots of noises from little kids because we like them to be here and hearing songs and hearing God's word, and spending time with their parents so they can watch their mom and dad, they can watch other people in the church, learn what it looks like to, to sit and to listen, learn what it looks like um, or learn what it means for their parent to be in church. So, we value young people. You as a whole church value young people. It's, it's why I have a job. Uh, Kara Powell from the Fuller Institute, um, if you've heard about Sticky Faith, and the Fuller Institute does tons of research on, on churches and church growth and, and teenagers and all just all sorts of really cool things. You can check them out. Um, but she talks about growing, growing churches and what makes them grow. Uh, at the, I went to a youth conference this past year and she was talking about growing churches, and they went to tons and tons of different churches, different ethnicities, different backgrounds, different denominations, all sorts of different things, but far and away the most important thing in church growth is that the church values young people. It said when young people are valued, the whole church thrives. And that, and that valuing young people is really placing value on the whole church. When we value young people, they are valued. Their parents all valued, and whole, whole families are valued. And that's what we, as, as the church are, as, as a family, that's, that's valuing. She brought up uh, the idea that percentage of the budget going towards youth is more important necessarily than the number, the amount going towards the youth. If the if this is the, the pie and all the money and you have you have a bigger slice to the youth, what happens is usually not everyone else gets shorted, but the whole pie gets bigger. She told a story about a church in California that was Spanish speaking only, all services in Spanish. They had people there that didn't speak any English, they had people there that spoke some English, and then they had some of the younger people who spoke a lot of English and only some Spanish. The church decided to hold a meeting asking if, hey, as a church, should we do more of our service, some parts of our service only in English to benefit the young people here who are want to learn in English. And you have the whole church, people who don't speak English at all, voting yes. I would rather not understand part of the service so, the way, so that that young person can. It's part of why we, we have Sunday school. It's part of why we do a lot of different things. We think of transitions in, in songs. At one point, someone was like, hey, I really like playing guitar. Could we do guitar in, uh, in church? And there's some people that were like, no. And there are other people that are like, yeah. We want to we wanna value you and you liking to play guitar and liking music. That's that. So, no, message isn't changing, but the medium is a little bit. The same thing would have happened for drums. As we switch from, from thing to thing, a lot of the things, um, if we want to look at ourselves, aren't necessarily always valuing just to me. So then we get to look at as a whole church. Or, or, okay, so when that decision is being made, who is being valued? As we're looking at the, the whole CE wing of the building, Who's being valued in that purchase, in that, in, that, in that bigger youth room, looking at kids? Some of you may not even really like have your own individual benefit. You're like, I don't go to Sunday school. I come to this side of the church, and then I walk back out. 
and there's nothing over there that's ever like happened that's directly related to you, but yet we're still trying to value th- through that and teaching your kids and teaching those that are around you. We have two rules in youth group. Treat each other with love and respect, and there's no exclusion, including self-exclusion. It's been discussed on the, on the CE board, the, the board of Christian education that we have here, that law and gospel are both taught from the youngest to the oldest in the church. If you're at Kingdom Kids, 45s, youth group, adult Sunday school, book club, that what you're going to get is law and gospel. That we would be like Moses and Jesus then in turn and teach God's commandments and of, of his mighty works to everyone, especially our children. And as we teach those things, we think about God's mighty works. Moses, Moses had it easy. I was just talking with the confirmation class that I got to inherit for today. God's mighty works were way more visible. They got to fall around a pillar of flame or pillar of cloud. They're like, that's the God we follow. See that giant blazing pillar of fire? That's, that's the one. Oh, remember when we were just in slavery? Yeah, we were just, we were just saved from that. Remember when we were like at the edge of the sea and we were like, oh, we're all going to die. And you were like, oh, we should just go say sorry and go back to Egypt and be slaves because at least we weren't dead as slaves. And then God opened up the Red Sea for us and provided us a way out. Remember that? And you got to be like, hey, remember when we were all complaining in the desert about not having any food and then there was just bread on the ground when we'd wake up? Do you remember that? And then still we were like, well, I'm not sure if God really provides for me. So let me just like save a little bit more for tomorrow. But anytime I try to save for tomorrow, that stuff would just all rot and God had provided new stuff every day. And it's super cool. We were, we were just talking about this. It, with the Sabbath, so on Fridays, there would be double the amount of manna on the ground. So that way they could save it and have it on Friday and on Saturday because they weren't supposed to be picking up bread and doing that work on a Saturday. And that was the only day the bread lasted two days. All the other times, bread lasted one day. They had to rely on God, providing them each and every day. And they're like, we don't like this water, it's bitter. God makes them sweet water. Hey, we don't have any water. God gives them water. We're sick of the bread that you give us for free. Give us some meat. Have some quail. This is my, it's, it's another like God and parenting mode. Um, where he's like, fine, you'll have meat. You'll get quail. You'll have so much quail, it'll be coming out of your nostrils. And as God's, God says that, so I can't be like, it probably, you know, like, it wouldn't have. No, I think actually people ate too much quail that came out of their nose. It's a lot of quail. You know, when your kid's like, I'm super hungry, you like feed them and they eat like half their plate and they're like, I'm done. You're like, nope. The rest of that, eat it too. That's all, that's all you. Like, I don't feel good. It's too bad. You get to eat that. God, God does all these mighty works and Jesus then shows so many people the same thing. He feeds thousands of people from just a little lunch. They also get bread for free. He heals people. He walks on water. He makes blind people see. He makes the lame walk. He does all of these different things. And and the culmination of all of Jesus' mighty works in his death on the cross and then resurrection from the dead. So alongside the commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and might, we teach of God's mighty works and what he's done for us as well. We have the law, we have the gospel. That's why we do Sunday school. Let me pray. God, thank you for your word that we get to see um, people struggling all throughout the Bible in, in doing the right thing struggle in, in teaching their, the next generation what is right, God. But thank you for examples um, in Moses, who, though we didn't get to see the promised land, sent the next generation to the promised land with your commands, teaching them about what, what you've taught, and that we get to see Jesus thousands of years later echo the same thing, to still have the greatest commandment be love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. 
heart, soul, and mind. And that, and that we would go and teach that diligently to our sons. And then he went and did that to people who didn't always deserve it, people who weren't just children of Israel. God, we thank you for the opportunity. Um, thank you for the blessing of word of life that we can uh, come here and, and hear from your word, that we can bring our kids here and part of uh, our own failure can be, can be filled by those willing to, to love our kids and teach them about you. Thanks for all you've done for us, Jesus. Praise in your name. Amen. And he shall come with trumpet sound. I have this Bible with a bunch of C.S. Lewis, Lewis quotes and writings in it. Um, and this one is from Ro- uh, Deuteronomy 6, 5, um, that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And this is what he writes about it. Some writers use the word charity to describe not only Christian love between human beings, but also God's love for man and man's love for God. About the second of these two, man's love for God, people are often worried They are told they ought to love God, and they cannot find any such feeling in themselves. What are they to do? The answer is the same as before. Act as if you did. Do not sit trying to manufacture feelings. Ask yourself, if I were sure that I loved God, what would I do? And when you have found the answer, go and do it. On the whole, God's love for us is a much safer subject to think about than our love for him. Nobody can always have devout feelings. And even if we could, feelings are not what God principally cares about. Christian love, either towards God or towards man, is an affair of the will. If we are trying to do his will, we are obeying the commandment, thou shalt love the Lord your God. He will give us feelings of love if he pleases. We cannot create them for ourselves, and we must not demand them as a right. But the great thing to remember is that though our feelings come and go, his love for us does not. It is not wearied by our sins, or our indifference, and therefore it is quite relentless in its determination that we shall be cured of those sins at whatever cost to us, at whatever cost to him. See this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.